Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Don't know about you, but this week's RTGA podcast would murder a blah. Okay, welcome along. How are we all doing? We have a special Waterford Tastic edition of the GA podcast this week, along with Rory O'Neill. Uh, I am joined by two sides of the great De La Salle Mount Sion divide. We have former Waterford managers, Porrick Fanning and Derek McGrath. How are you doing today, lads? How are you doing, lads? Good, good. 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 How are you? How are you, brother? Right, it's uh, great to have you with us, lads, and um, we're going to get on there now and chat about the um, Watford Hearn Championship quarterfinals in a little while. We've dealt with Dallas Island against Mount Sion, which always just interests me because you're two clubs practically in each other's pockets where the parish rule doesn't matter, and you know there's a great rivalry there with yourselves and Roll Moore, and it's it's just kind of an uh, it just seems like an interesting match to kind of focus on this week. But there's been a bit of news around this week, and. Um, It'd be good to get your take on a couple of things here. Um, the Kevin McStay spoke on RT Two FM's game on earlier in the week, saying he kind of thought the, he had his doubts about the 2020 Intercounty Championship. You know, we've 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 been going through stages here where we thought we'd have no GA, then it was coming back, and we were great to have club, and now everybody's getting a little bit wary. I think. Um, Derek, where would you stand now? Because um, where Kevin's coming from is that maybe for some counties it won't add up. The expense of running a couple of inter-county teams when the income is obviously so impacted by the coronavirus. Yeah, look, probably struck a little bit by the the negativity around that kind of particular approach. Not Kevin's approach, but in terms of Corey will tell you there, and, and anyone involved in, in inter-county management, that's that's the narrative anyway. In terms of you know budgetary constraints that are on teams over the years, and obviously naturally now because of what's happened that kind of lends itself to probably more negative connotations around, you know, what will be available and finance, etc. I think we'd probably be more advisable kind of concentrate on, on the, the element of hope that we have around the championship, you know. Um, again, there's none of us experts in the whole area of, of, of health, if you like, and, and people's health, if you like. So the talk of regionalised lockdowns based on an outbreak in, in, a, in an area is probably the, the most wor- worrisome thing in terms of what could happen if... You know, the week that Watford are playing Tipper or Cork, for instance, that, you know, someone presents with symptoms that week, you know, it's the plan B and the plan C scenario more than anything else. And I'd imagine that advisory group, which we spoke about before, there's, there's a serious brains trust there and there's people, you know, the people with on the ground and more more kind of informed than us. But I'd be hopeful that it would come. And I, I don't think it is the concentration on finances shouldn't really, it's the concentration really on the game and what it's about, regardless of the finances, is, is where I'd be putting the, the emphasis on really. Yeah, for would you think that if it has to be a kind of a slim-lined kind of yellow pack championship, shall we say, where counties are more cognizant of what it costs to prepare a team and maybe maybe cut a few corners here or there without obviously impacting on anybody's anybody's safety and you know the provincial championships are run in as cost-effective a way as possible. Should should we be looking at that to ensure that we get some championships? Yeah, well, look, I, like, as Derek said, all hopeful that we will get championships because I think, look, the positivity that's been there with the clubs up and running and, you know, everyone's looking forward now as well. You, there's, a, there's a real excitement about, the, you know, the winter period as well when the, with the hurling and football coming up. So I do hope, you know, the boards and, you know, maybe Crow Park find a way. And so, yeah, I agree with Derek in regards to the finance side of it. Um, yeah, I think everybody has to be, you know... Um, cognizant of, of the fact that it is going to cost a lot of money. So maybe Crow Park as well, you know, whether it's in the form of grants or whatever, it held towards, you know, county boards. Only they know the financial situation at a national level. So they know probably what funds may be available. I know, you know, the government did offer support as well for various sporting bodies, you know, to, you know, to get things up and running and to, you know, prepare for it and for COVID and how they do things. So maybe there's a way, I don't know if there's a, like that's, that's what the, at, a, at a national level and through their governance, you know, can they generate income to help with boards and provide support? I don't think it can be loans or anything like that. But, you know, hopefully maybe there's some way of doing it that way. But it is important that, you know, we concentrate on getting the games played anyway. And hopefully the financial side of it, you know, be it, you know, by cutting certain corners, maybe 
as you said, without impacting on health, maybe they can cut back on something as regards some of the expenditure they may have. But the big thing is to try and get the games played and to, you know use work together, you know, nationally with with, with the county boards to make sure that they have the support and the finance available to do that. Yeah, Rory, the, the, there's some reports in the last couple of days that some of the county boards are a little concerned they won't get these, you know, these operating grants that, you know, they've kind of been promised they mightn't get them this year. You know, there could be delay, depends on what, you know, the government has to divvy out this 30 or 40 million, so we don't know how much the GA are going to get. And there, I think we're getting to the point with these county boards where it's not just a matter of the promise of money, there's serious cash flow problems or there could be serious cash flow problems. Huge issues. I mean, the biggest, the biggest issue that they will face when the government starts to divvy out that um, honey pot, which is, um, which still has to be, you know, applied for, gone through all the red tape, etc. Biggest issue is what they actually spend that money on. My experience, um, just having been involved in club committees, is that you should never be spending any sort of large sums of money on day to day, and that, and, and to be honest. Um, an intercounty championship would probably constitute a day-to-day expense as opposed to a capital investment. Now, um, so if you get, let's say if they were to manage to get 20, 30 million, that probably will be needed to sustain the organization across the board because you're going to have a whole plethora of clubs and counties that will have run into um, major financial issues as a result of their own sort of micro um, fundraising mechanisms having dried up. So that's where a large chunk of that money will probably have to go. I can't really see them. I mean, no, maybe they maybe they will just on a one off. Maybe the government might apply pressure to use that money to run the intercounty championships, but um, it wouldn't be a very wise thing to do. What I'd be saying from the GAs, and I've said this last week here, I think is um, the, the GA will be well within their remit to approach the government and say, you need to give us a hand here, whether that's, uh, in terms of running the intercounty championships, because these will help the nation through what's going to be a very long and bleak winter, mm-hmm. and you need to give us a dig out here because we will. There will be sustenance for the na- for the national mood in what we will be able to deliver. But whether that's on the logistics, Garda cooperation, because the Garda Garda bill is quite quite the Garda bill every year is uh, quite expensive. The organisational aspects. So if they can get a bit of a dig out there, I certainly agree with the two lads that the counties themselves will probably have to cut their cloth in terms of what they will be able to achieve within their own budgets. And I think the lads are spot on. Like The most important thing really is that we should try and get the games played regardless of what teams can spend on what. Mm. If the games do go ahead, um, Desi Farrell won't have Paul Clark on the sideline. The um, Dublin Great has stepped away from his role as a coach and selector with the Dublin Senior Footballers and the reports are that he is going to be replaced or at least Brian O'Regan of um, uh, sorry of um, Bally Bowden sorry I had uh, my brain froze there for a second Bally Bowden is going to come in um, I know this is big ball stuff lads not really not really your realm but but Derek it is whether Paul's left or, or you know, by his own volition, which I think is what has happened, it is, kind of, it is important to keep a backroom fresh, isn't it? And a manager, obviously, is always going to want to bring in his own, his own people. That's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Yeah, and I suppose it's, it's probably, you know, not speculative now at this stage, but it's, sometimes there's, there's, there's truth to the, to the kind of what's happened behind the scenes. There might be a kind of a, not a fallout of some sort or a difference of opinion. You know, there was huge speculation around Donny Buckley's role, for instance, within, within the Kerry circles and why he stepped away or didn't step away, etc. And even ourselves over the years, I remember year one, um, I, I, we lost Frank Flannery and Willie Marr at the end of year one and, and we'd been relegated and things weren't going particularly well. And, Genuine reasons on the lads' behalf that they were stepping away, and you know, you know, they were just actually stepping away. They'd only agreed to come on board for for one year, but again, it's rife with speculation around the place. You know, it's very hard to control that. So then you look at Brian Cody over the years, where Noel Skeen and John Welch were part of his backroom team. Then Derek Ling comes in, and James McGarry come in, and he kind of freshens it every year. And sometimes there's almost a kind of a, a perceived pressure on managers. Oh, you need to freshen it up. So. You know, so I, I'm not sure where I'd stand on that. Sometimes people react to a need to freshen up, but sometimes sustainability of the same guys, the loyalty and, and the, the knowledge base of the guys you have with you are needed as well. So, yeah, it's interesting, um, you know, what, what's behind it, I suppose. The, the continuity that was suggested, I read this morning, with Paul Clark's involvement from, from Jim Gavin's era, you know, being involved. Yeah. And, and I, again, only, only, 
reading about that chap O'Regan last night on, on his huge reputation in coaching circles and you know they've lost I think I'm not sure I don't think Jason Sherlock is involved in that background team either and they seem to be a just from the outside looking in again um, in terms of the, the basketball background that, that Sherlock had there seemed to be a real kind of connection between Sherlock and that team even an on-field connection on match days in terms of his role as a mayor Ferner and um, yeah like so it, it's interesting so it's, sometimes yeah it's good to freshen up but other times you know it's, it's as handy to kind of to keep keep what's necessarily um, kind of you know uh, positive for your setup so yeah watch it with interest because it happens in every in every year you know sometimes you'd hear if a team doesn't go well oh you, you're brought into not the county board review but you're told oh you might need to freshen up your backroom team and everyone analyzes these days unfortunately and and it's a uh, yeah it's, it's interesting development all right yeah um yourself Porik, you were a member of a couple of backroom teams with, with Davy Fitzgerald it's uh is it is it a difficult dynamic to get right or Davy seems to have freshened things up down in Wexford he's brought in obviously a couple of of local hands shall we say um is that important as well it's not a, it's not an issue very much in Dublin obviously they tend to to keep it pretty Dublin centric yeah. but it does Dave did Davy put a lot of stock in his backroom team or was it just these are my guys and these are my guys I know, of course, of course, he, he he did, and I think you know everyone does. But it's background teams are important. But you know, some of the things happen naturally as well, and people move on. You re- and they let you actually refresh your backroom team that way. It could be similar in Dublin. Who knows? You know, maybe with the long the long year, and you know, maybe maybe Paul Clark had decided he's only going to stay for this year, and it's dragged on longer than he than it planned. So I think it's all speculation on that front. So I wouldn't, you know, get too get too involved in it. And I, you know, I think whereas you know you're asking me about Wexford and that, I think again. Um, it has it has changed from time to time, but there's a lot of good, there's a lot of continuity there too. So um, no, I think so. As I said, a lot of those changes will happen as a as a natural progression of the team and of the different people of people moving on as well. So you know that that happens. It's the same in jobs. It's the same in, in everything. So it's not it's not much different in the sporting sphere either. Yeah, uh, Derek mentioned that these stories can can grow legs, um, Rory, and I suppose the fact that this comes a few weeks after or a month or two after Jack McCaffrey decided to step away, you know. With such a focus on Dublin, you know, there, there'll, there'll be people thinking that, you know, two and two equals eight here. And um, I'd say Desi, like a lot of inter-county managers, would just love some matches to come back now. So that's what people will be talking about. I think I think people are so desperate for any chinks, any chinks in the armour to appear at all. Um, you know, they'll just grab it and run with it. And whether that's Jack McCaffrey stepping away or Paul Clark, but look... Dublin is such a well-run machine at inter-county level and um, across the board, really, to be fair. And it's so well-run that no matter who at this stage, no matter how big... I mean, like, if you look at the players that they've lost down through the years through different, you know, Rory O'Carroll, you know, Jack McCaffrey himself, the different players that have retired, and it just trundles on. Jim is gone, Desi's in. I don't necessarily think it's going to make too much of a difference. I think the one thing I would say about Paul Clark is my own club here, we very nearly uh, got him over the line in terms of taking over our first team before he went in with back went back in with Jim. Uh, very good reputation in terms of his coaching abilities. A fitness fanatic. He's in a he's in unbelievable shape. He'd probably still be able to tag out, uh, you know, certainly at cl- club level. Um, and I know he's a busy job there, and who knows what kind of pressures they're under, especially in the airport at the minute, because I think he is an airport policeman. But you know, like I think. He's not going to be, uh, I wouldn't necessarily think he'd be idle for too long. Um, because it, it, once the old managerial merry-go-round begins again in earnest, if it does back in next, next February. Yeah. Uh, before we get on to matters, Watford, I, I think we, we didn't really get around to it last week. And it, it, in fairness, the GPA on this podcast and pretty much everywhere get quite a lot of slack. Um, Sorry, quite a lot of flack. They get no slack um, for for this. Yeah, that is sick. Yeah, yeah. Sick. That is sick. That they, but um, in fairness, they released their fixtures plan, the proposal that they're going to bring to the the fixtures committee, and there's a lot to like about it. For you've been quite outspoken about this. Um, you've you've devised your own plan, which we might come back to on another occasion to look at because it's quite interesting. You kind of link the league and the championship in quite a novel way. Um, the the GPA, it's not rocket science, but they're just saying. Let's let, let's condense this intercounty season and let's give the club its own time from from July until November or October. Um, it's a sensible plan, and the word I hear from within Crow Park is that they are they favour something similar. So the GP the, the messenger mightn't be mightn't be shot here. This might actually be 
something close to this might actually be proposed at Congress. Um, would that go far enough for you? Yeah, look, I, I, I'm actually delighted to see that the GPA, you know, have come to the table with something along those lines. Um, I suppose I've been consistent in the, in the sense that I do feel there needs to be club activity in the summer and at, at some period, but there also needs to be room for inter-county players to breed and the inter-county came to prosper. And I don't want to think they're pulling and dragging. And we saw that when, you know, at the start of the, of the, of the you know, the COVID, when we the return to play, that needs, that, that, that needs to be taken away and, and that can help the players, help the county managers, help the club managers. And I think the GPA could then see, I think it's very, very possible. I think it's exciting, actually, that to hear people talking of blank canvases and everything on the table and willing to, you know, look at this seriously. And I think it's a huge opportunity now for the GEA to, you know, do something really, really positive for the entire GEA population, club and county. And really put something in place that I think will only lead to the GA prosper even further for the next few years because I do think like the inter county game is fantastic. The the level it's got to is huge, and to keep that going, but also to you know to keep the conveyor belt coming from the clubs and the interest in the club game, that's the other side of it. And I think that's where we have to get to. And I think there's a happy balance that can be found. And I'm delighted to see the GPA, you know, and I I would, I, but I would hope that you know. It does. The only thing I would say, I do, I do hope that it involves, you know, everybody looking at definitely ensuring there's summer hurling and football for club players as part of it. You know, I don't, I don't think you can go to a thing where there's nothing happening until September or late August. That's that would defeat the purpose. Yeah, Der- Derek, we we were chatting about something similar um, a few weeks ago on the podcast. I suppose the fear is that if the intercounty game is over by July those traditional dates which are already lost in September, you know, and, and you, you lose August and there's talk of, you know, we're, we're seeding ground to rugby or to soccer or whatever. How do you balance that with the idea of, you know, less strain on players at underage, college, senior and club, like inter-county and club level and given club, do you think the club players should be given August and September um, you know, we obviously they're in the spotlight at the moment and everybody's enjoying the streaming. But do you think we could lose out if the inter-county, the, you know, the, the stars of the show, shall we say, are, are taken out of those late summer, summer months? I actually think the opposite, believe it or not. And I, look, I've been an advocate for, for actually the GPA's system that they've, they've put forward for the last two years. I actually wrote an article on it two years, two years ago now about the whole split season. I, I, and the example I give, I suppose, is... I, I had a very, very brief inter-county career only involved for three or four years. So I, I've been a club player for 20 years, I suppose, with, with De La Salle as such. And certainty, I suppose, is the word. Well, there's balance and certainty that are needed, right? And and for years, like even I know De La Salle last year in 2019, they were back training on the 1st of January, right? Um, 2nd of January, trained really hard into January. Cork had, had Waterford in the league final then, and they only got one round then because Waterford had got a run in the league final. And then they're back. So I, I think... Then what you have is you have the narrative from the club player, which is a genuine narrative. Look, oh, we don't know when we're playing. Uh, I'm not sure when we're playing. And then, believe it or not, my experience as De La Salle manager when I was involved this two years was, you know, you talk about the summer months and club players. In actual fact, I had to split the season as a manager to make sure we almost had kind of mini pre-seasons to kind of, uh, now lads, this is holiday time, first two weeks in July. If you want to get a holiday, boys, take your holiday here and we'll be coming back when Watford are out of the championship, etc. And I think every club manager has done similar over the last number of years. So I think this would give the club player certainty. I don't think he'd have to come back in January to a, to a pre-season. He could actually come back post Patrick's day to a pre-season, you know, with, with, with a, with a first weekend in August starting day to a championship. The, the Fitzgibbon can be restored to its rightful uh, place. The Sigerson can be restored to its rightful place in January, February with, with possible bylaws that would actually prevent the boys that are involved in Fitzgibbon actually training with their inter-county team. You know, be as stringent as that. Leave them train away with the, the Fitzgibbon team. Leave them, you know, socialise, enjoy the college atmosphere. Widen the panel berths for guys that come back into pre-season for county teams in, in February. And have a kind of a, a well-marketed situation where you start your league in the end of March. You have a two-week window as the league ends before you go into the championship. And the marketing and the promotion, I feel, would be huge. And at the same time, the CPA and the Club Players Association and the club players themselves can be working behind the scenes in terms of uh, a novel, innovative, you know, whether it's Munster Leagues, Leinster Leagues. You know, why can't you have a day, for instance, when Waterford played Limerick in, in Welsh Park last year? 
why can't you have De La Salle versus Napier Sheik on that day in, in De La Salle club grounds, Mount Sign versus Bally Brown or, you know, Patrick Swell. There's, there's lots of innovation within both the GPA and the CPA. And it's just about kind of coming together with ideas around that. And if you have, I know we've talked about it more for over the years, an incentivized league and then it leads into the championship. But if you actually went cross kind of pollination on it in terms of the, the ran it with the county teams, ran it with the county games on those Sundays around Robin games and had a kind of social gatherings, almost fail alike gatherings. I think there'd be a huge buy-in. And, it, and the irony of it is as well, because there's so much debate about it at the moment, I think it's an ideal opportunity to bring sponsors on board for the club championship as well. I think there'd be, there's a feeling there that, that people would want to get behind that kind of spirited community-based kind of, you know, organisational kind of structure that, that exists out there particularly, you know, post-COVID or mid-COVID, if you like that, we hear we're lending support to people that are right in, in tune with the, with, the, with the very bedrock of the GA. So I'd be very much for it. I don't think we lose anything in it. And I think the boys then would have November, December, January possibly off. They can travel, they can chill out. There's an off-season and I'd be very much for it. And I says, as I said, it's, it gives them certainty. I don't think the April club month has worked over the years because you look two years ago, I think I said this before that I met some of the Cork players down in, down in Mahan Point. I met two of the Cork players down there. They were going in eight days before they played tip in, in, in Parky Creeve last year. No preparation, whereas Liam had, had facilitated the arrangement of the, the Tipperary games being played, I think, early April or early April, and they had a five or six week run in. And it gives it more of a kind of a, a level playing field when, 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 when it's split season, if you like. And my, my experience of Waterford is it's what the players want to. It's, it's actually what the players want. That's that, yeah. that would be that's what I would have picked up on. 100%. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that, that's the key. And Rory, from a club player point of view as well, this year has been kind of heavenly for most uh, at all levels because their seasons are... Con- you, you could say condensed, but that makes it sound like it's being rushed. The seasons have been played off at a sensible pace with a game a week or maybe a game, two games every three weeks. They know when those games are now. They know when the county final is fixed for whatever grade they're playing at. They know when the season's going to be over. And they know, not that anybody's going on a holiday this year, really, but, you know, they can plan their lives. So from the inter-county player down to the club player, the whole thing makes, seems to make a lot of sense. Oh, listen, there's a great buzz around the club championships at the minute, uh, COVID aside. Now, there's a great buzz given the fact that there's just only 200 people can go in and watch them, but, um, or less, like, you know, but I, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, the only caveat that I would add to it all is, it will be one small issue that I would spot with this. When you split the season between club and county, the one person who I think is actually <clears throat> um, under a lot of pressure in that sort of scenario is the inter-county player, because he's the guy that's going to have to play all the way through a very, very difficult grind of an inter-county season and down tools once that's over and begin it all over again with the club. And invariably, these are guys that are always expected to kind of almost put the club up on their back too when they get into it. So it's a huge pressure in terms of they're the one, they're, it's the elite player that then is being expected to almost play nine, ten months of the year. The club gets the club. They're already doing that. <laughs> I know, and, and, but I, but I suppose only doing 10 months, is it? <laughs> that, that, that is true, I suppose. But I suppose if you are looking at the player welfare side of it, which is what the GPA state that is their obvious aim, then I'm not entirely sure if elongating a, a playing season that where the inter-county player is the one that comes off worst is actually in their own best interests. And I suppose it's probably only something that you're going to see when we get it into practice. Mm. Okay, gents, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll leave the national issues there and we'll get down to the nitty-gritty here of the local. Uh, this weekend, we have the uh, Waterford Hurling Championship quarterfinals, including a um, Waterford City derby between De La Salle and Mount Sion. Um, we're lucky, coincidentally, to be joined by the managers of the, of the last winning teams from each club. Uh, unfortunately, you're going back to 06, for uh, Mount Sion and Pork, you managed them to victory and to 2012, Derek, when you managed De La Salle. Um, since then, by the idea here or there has pretty much been the Bally Gunner show and we might get onto that shortly. But let's start with, I've been reading up a little. I know that you are based from, you are both from the top of the town, as it's called, and you're in each other's pockets. So I might go to you first, Pork. Um, yeah. How does player recruitment work when you're, you're obviously yourselves, your two clubs and Roan Moore, as far as I know, you're 
pretty much battling for the same pool of players, yeah? Yeah, I suppose, look, we're all city-based clubs and um, it's, it's, it is, it's, um, because we're in the city, you know, as the city expands and houses, houses estates pop up, you know, people end up going, was living in different, different estates within the city and they could be from different backgrounds, the clubs are, you know, traditionally who they play for. So that happens, like, for instance, Owen Dunphy, who would have, would have managed Dennis Allen, played under 21 with Wadford as well and played senior a bit, like, Owen lived just three doors around the corner for me and, Derek's brother Rod John Milan lived 100 yards up the road. And, you know, I did play for Dennis Sal and I played for Mount Sign and we had great fun on the green, I suppose, at times, um, you know, growing up. But that's the way it was. And recruitment traditionally, I suppose, look, both, all clubs are nearly attached to a school. I know for us, I suppose, we're, the, the school would, would have been our main. And it's changed a little bit now. Dem- the demographic has changed, I suppose, there too. It's a city, inner city school um, in Mount Sign. But a lot of our recruitment comes through, I suppose, mainly fam- the family history. And, and the school itself. And similarly, I know there you can speak for Dennis Al with St. Declan's and, you know, the, the school there in, and Dennis Al and Stephen Street as well. So, you know, that's the primary schools and then onto the secondary mm-hmm. schools. So that's the way, I suppose. It's different at secondary level, I suppose. But the majority comes through, the, for us, would be recruitment through the school and families. And that's it. We have a very small pick now for a city club in Mount Sign because, like as I said, the demographic and where people are living has changed and we have a lot of players now. Okay. You know, I'm growing up there, so it's a bit different. Okay. Uh, Derek, how important is the school to De La Salle? Obviously, because you've had a fair bit of success at school level. And, like, like, what kind of percentage of the secondary school team would be? Would they all be De La Salle club, club players, or could they, be, could they be drawn from other clubs? No, they'd actually be the majority. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be mostly, I suppose, De La Salle. But Valley, we'd have a huge, like, every sixth class of Valley Gunner, we'd. we'd if there was 50 guys, 50 coming in from Ballygunner in first year, the 46 or 7 of them come to De La Salle, maybe 3 or 4 to Waterpark. We'd have huge in, influx of fellas from Ballygunner and De La Salle. Yeah, as Parik said, we have two primary schools, St. Declan's, who's right across the road from De La Salle College Secondary School and St. Stephen Street, um, right in the heart of the city. So um, mostly, most of the intake from, of students that are hurling related or any related, nearly all of them would go to De La Salle College. And, you know, the, the tradition would be that, you you know, the primary school teacher would have a massive influence within those school <laughs> sections, you know, and, and they'd have them hurling and you get to them early, I suppose, you know, in, in terms of the, um, you know, the intake of students for, for uh, De La Salle um, club. But yeah, the school, no, we'd have, we'd have a number of feeder schools. We'd be, or we'd have a number of feeder clubs. We'd have Passage, we'd have Ballygunner, we'd have Ferrybank, we'd have De La Salle club. We'd have a couple of South Kilkenny schools, Munkine, Pilltown, a couple from Carrick, even a couple from Ferrybank over across the bridge as well. So, we'd have a kind of a huge intake. We'd have 1,200 boys, so we'd have a huge intake of students from a number of clubs. But yeah, it's a De La Salle school. The De La Salle brothers are still living on site there. So it's, it's, it's De La Salle by name, but certainly in terms of the, the intake of students, there's a, there's a plethora of clubs involved. Yeah, it's almost like a, a, a Dublin rugby school there. You know, you've got the, uh, the school and then the loose attachment to the club. It's, a, it's an interesting kind of uh, way to go at it. Rory, you... You're from Cork City. Um, I think the hurling scene might be slightly diluted in Cork City that, you know, the football is probably more prominent than it is in Waterford. But it is, like, obviously, it, there's a huge number of urban, you know, city-dwelling hurlers. But I suppose for a lot of people, even people living in Dublin because the Cubs are more spread out, it's a kind of, it, it, it does give a unique feel to rivalries, doesn't it, when, as the lads are saying, housing estates could, could house players from two or three different rival clubs. Without any, without any doubt, I think if you look back at like a lot of people will say, fit, like, and I don't mean this in any way, in any disparaging sense to the lads now, but if you look back at, we'll say, Watford in the under Justin is probably the easiest way to describe it. Watford under Justin McCarthy, they were kind of almost everybody's second team. Um, you know, if you weren't from uh, Watford. Uh, and you were, you certainly, you, you know, weren't from Cork or Kenny. They were the team that you kind of really rooted for because they did play the game with a real sort of swashbuckling swagger and very typical of a lot of Justin McCarthy, Justin McCarthy teams and the style with which he would play the game anyway. But I think what was more striking about them was they felt very much like a city team. You know, there was a sort of an urban swagger about them as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, like, there, you know, you had Dan, like, obviously in the era, pre-Helmet, you know, so you had so many characters like John, uh, Derek's brother-in-law, like Dan Shanahan, like Ken McGrath, 
like Paul Flynn. And they kind of, you know, like they wore their hat in their sleeves, lads with tattoos, gestures to the crowd as a supporter and as a Cork supporter, even though we love to hate them and all of that, you couldn't but admire it because I thought it was brilliant for the game, brilliant for the game of hurling because it showed that it, hurling could be kind of cool and sexy. <laughs> and I think that definitely did come from that sort of urban sense within Waterford City where I suppose Mount Sion, De La Salle and and the city clubs would start to drive it. And there was always be a sense that certainly from me, from, and I'm interested to hear the lads' views, that the, the, the club hurling scene, I know Ballygunner have been the preeminent side, fair, fair play to them, but the, that the, the club hurling scene in Walford would have always been very healthy, very strong, good, um, and a good spread of clubs, certainly at the top end. And um, really, I suppose, really looking forward to this weekend in one sense. Yeah, so the uh, yourselves there, Pork, are well out in front with, with, with 35 titles, but you know, a, a lot of them were won in massive chunks. In the well, you, you, you won, you played in 10 county finals yourself and won five. So, yeah. like in later years, they obviously won quite a lot, but a big one of big chunks in the 50s and 60s. But until this period of Ballygunner um, dominance, the Waterford Hurling Championship had been, as, as Rory says, a very, very healthy competitive competition, hadn't it? I've had, yeah. But you're going in the middle of a big chunk themselves at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> and... Um, seven in a row. Is it seven in a row now? They're going yeah, for they're seven going, in a row. Yeah, they're going, yeah, they're going for seven in a row. So, and yes, they have, they have been a dominant team. You know, it's um, no doubt about that. But I do think, um, like, I, I think there's an awful lot of work that's going on, you know, even even with the other clubs and ourselves in Mount Sinai and, and in Dallas Hall. I think, I think the, the, that gap is closing a little bit too. Um you do get periods where teams are dominant. It was never probably a team as dominant in recent years as Benny Gunner have been now. Um, but I do think it's not, you know, it's, I think all the clubs, particularly, you know, they have a very well-balanced team this year. Um, you know, you saw, the, like I know Abby said, not, so even you look at the Waterford County team, there's a fair spread of players from around a lot of clubs there. Even though Benny Gunner are dominant, they don't dominate, I suppose, in terms of numbers on the county team as well. So mm. that will tell you there's a lot of hurling going on at all levels in Waterford and, as Rory quietly points out there, you know, there's, there's, there is a good spread. There's a good balance. And I think, you know, there's not as, there's not a big a gap as people think there is between, between the, between the clubs. And that includes maybe Bally Gunner. Like I was involved with two minor teams myself in Mount Sinai there in recent years. And we lost two minor county finals narrowly to Bally Gunner. One of them by a point to Bally Gunner, you know, and a lot of those guys are coming into the senior setup now. A lot of Bally Gunner team have guys from that senior, from that, those minor teams as well. So, you know, they still have that bit of class though, as well as of lads who have been around the block and that, that helps hugely, you know. But I do think the, the gap is closing a little bit. Yeah. Derek, it's, again, doing a little bit of research, I couldn't help but notice that, particularly in matches between Ballygunner, De La Salle and Mount Sion over the last kind of 10, 15, 20 years, it's, it hasn't always been the friendliest of rivalries, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> and that includes spectators, from what I was reading uh, not too long ago. <laughs> Look, it's, been, it's been lively, shall we say. It's been, at least that's been taken away. That's the one, one advantage of the COVID, I suppose. <laughs> 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 I know, like, sometimes it can often be worse when they're away. But, uh, yeah, look, it's, uh, yeah, it's been, look, it's been, I think, look, from our point of view, I suppose, we would have seen Ballygunner and Mount Sinai nearly dominate county finals for year after year, you know, you know, you know, eighties, nineties, and you're looking at a county final for years, and you're saying, "Will you ever be involved?" You know, "Will you ever actually be involved?" And and there's a kind of an, a, an inherent jealousy towards the other two teams, if you want me to be completely honest, in terms of mm. you know how they went about their business. Even when you said their party played in ten county finals and won five, I'm kind of there. Jesus, <laughs> it's like when you read, it's like when you read on the end of the Sunday game, think you know Jackie Tiernan line all Ireland. You, kind of, <laughs> you nearly kind of say to yourself, "Jesus," but uh, you know, and 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 it's it's. And so I suppose when we made our we made our breakthrough in 08, you know, the first and, and it came on the back of John beginning to kind of dominate club game, our county, the county scene. Oh, he, he was kind of it was on the end of Waterford being beaten comprehensively in the other final. And that was our breakthrough year. We've been in the final in 05, having beaten Mount Sinai for the first time ever in championship in 05, in the semi-final of 05, um, ha having received some unbelievable pummelings, uh, uh, you know, at their hands over the years. And we made a breakthrough then, and I suppose we had a fail of winning team in 99 
and and the bones of that particular team started to form the, the kind of central kind of spine of the of the senior team in Ian Flynn and Kevin Moore and and obviously Alex John and and, and Brian Derek, 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 out of curiosity, could I ask you that failure winning team? Hmm. Uh, would you know how many graduated to play senior hurling then? Just um, I, 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 um, I'd say there was six, seven. So I've have Kevin, I've a name offhand now. Kevin Moore, and Ian Flynn, Porig Nevin. Um, so seven is good though, isn't yeah, it? That... Yeah, we would we'd have yeah, and and that was a fa- we won the B fail in in ninety nine in in Wexford, and just kind of a good group and and we had a good group in school that went very close to winning the Hearty. You know, you don't hear about it when you don't win it, but they were kind of the basis of of that. And then of course, as I said, we had Brian Phelan and Kevin and. John making waves at county level, and you know you, you had a period where you just the, the 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 base of all the work that was being done at underage started to come to fruition and a bit more belief there than than there was evident over the other years. So we got there, but yeah, it, it's it's interesting that you know I, I think someone wrote here locally in the last few weeks that Ballygunner have been in twenty two of the last twenty four county finals. You know they've been in. It's it's it's. It's huge, and I suppose we've looked, yeah. and, and I suppose the lazy analysis around Ballygunner is that they have huge numbers, and but they work really hard out there as well, and we're all just playing catch up, and we are working as hard in De La Salle and in 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 in, in Mount Sinai and in other clubs, Rome Moore, etc. They're working really hard to bridge the gap, but it's it's you, you could see a situation where Ballygunner will probably be involved in the next ten semi finals of 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 Waterford as well, and people just have to accept that and trying to get get up there with them and 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 work as hard as them because they're um. I'd see what's coming in the school now. You know, a very an exceptional minor there, Patrick Fitzgerald minor again next year. The, Brian O'Sullivan will probably be back from his travels next year, and they they may get stronger as well. You know, in, in the absence of of maybe a year out of it, or if if we could overturn them this year, if Mount Saint can overturn them, they still will be around the scene for the next you know ten fifteen years. I'd imagine. Would, would, would you think that? Would you think though, given like the dominance and like obviously, look, get, granted the Munster Club. Provincial Championship, the Munster Club particularly, is a bear pit. I mean, it's a really, really difficult championship mm-hmm. to win. The five best teams in Munster are all playing off against each other. But would you think that Ballygunner have underachieved at provincial and, and, and All-Ireland level, given their dominance over the last seven, eight, nine, ten years? Uh, well, they'll, they'll tell you. If, you. if you spoke to Philip Manny, he'd tell you they have. But I, I, I'd, I'd, give you, I'd give you a counter-argument. I'd say that I, I personally think that they got caught last year. I know that people would say... Yeah. I know. Oh, Barcelona were lucky. That's my personal opinion, right? That they got caught. I actually thought they were well tuned to win that game last year and they just got caught. So what they've had is, is they've met exceptional teams in the Pierce. And I think they've just been the victims of... I still think there's an All-Ireland club in Ballygunner in the next... Three years, I, I, you know, but it's 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 whether or not the, the lack of a mon- monster club takes away from their 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 attitude this year or their, their, their kind of need to go there. So I would argue that they haven't underachieved. They've just met really really um, good teams on on given days, and and the Pierce should be probably been the you know the, the most prominent example of that. But um, other than that, I would say last year was the, was their year to. You know that that they were going well. Daisy Hutchinson's kind of you know injection into the team and what he was bring given to him. And I I feel that if they played Boris Lee ten times with all due respect to Boris Lee, I, I I think they'd win eight out of ten of them. You know. Yeah, Borg, Do we get too concerned about these like eras of dominance for certain clubs? Now, Ballygunner, say Cora Finn, Cross McGlen for about twenty odd years there. Bally Hale at the moment in Kilkenny. You know, Mount Zion did it for periods. You know, in the fifties, sixties, and in your day. Um, you know, and, and club hurling in Waterford survived and thrived and then another team comes good. It's kind of the nature of it. And I suppose in a way it gives Mount Sion, it gives De La Salle, it gives all the other clubs, you know, a target to aim at, I suppose, if it was being swapped between different yeah. clubs every year, it'd be romantic, but it wouldn't be the same challenge, would it? No, but I do think like in the fairness, as Derek said, like Barry Gunnar set the bar very high. That's the way I've always looked at it too, even when I suppose we were winning and teams would say it's, it's two Mount Sion, Barry Gunnar. Um, that's the bar. The bar is there, and you've got to get up to it, you know. And I, I know we're working very hard, and other clubs are to get up to that bar, and that's fair enough. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's a bad thing um, for a team to dominate. I think it doesn't mean hurling stops in every other place, in every other club, in every other parish in the county. It certainly doesn't. Um, if anything, people work harder to get up there, and 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 the end result is, you know, a, a spread of players from around the county, um, and it's not as dominant. Like you know, I know. Uh, Derek, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think um, that Isal won 321s in a row there in 15, 16, and 17. So yeah. most of those players now are probably, what, had three years, 23, 24 years of age. Yeah. Um, probably we, the bones of our senior... 
Yeah. And beat Bally Gunner in a couple of those finals. Is that right? Yeah, Derek? so yeah. yeah. So, so like they're going to be there now at the moment. Again, looking at they're probably in their prime now, and that's probably the basis of a lot of their team at the moment. So it's not as as I said, I'm not saying that, of course they're dominant and the and the and the similar where they have shows that. But the gap that, as regards the quality of players that to answer your question, there's still a lot of hurling going on in the other clubs and there's a lot of good players there. Yeah, you're talking up Della Salle there, good man. Um, Mount Sion, <laughs> what, what, what's the story with Austin Gleeson? I watched it last night. I think it was a, it was a, it was a hell of a shoulder, but you have to say the Roe Moore man kind of ducked into it a bit. It looked like a harsh red. Is he any chance of appealing it, do you know? I'm glad you called it a shoulder as well. Um, and that would be my view. Um, there was yeah, a, ro- look, a robust shoulder. <laughs> well, look, I'm, I, I'm obviously being accused of being biased. Of course I would. And my, 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 my view of it is that it was um, an inter-county intensity challenge in a club game by a, high, a very, very fit Austin Gleeson, who was on top of his game at the moment. And he came, he came on it so quickly. And it wasn't as if he met him. You know, might, this is my opinion of it. He didn't meet him in the chair. He met him side on. He's a six foot two man tackling a five foot eight guy. And it was a big, big hit. But as I said, you don't ju- I don't think cards should be judged by the level of intensity. I think mm. it was a good to me, I'd be just and I think, you know, Peter Queedy as manager of Rome Moore as well would be expecting guys in that, that as well to make those type of challenges. It was a it was a big hit. I'm not denying that. It was it was, it was a thundering hit. I was at the game myself. But to me, when you know, the man turned into him, he met him, as I said, side on, and that's and, and that's what he attempted to do. And for me, I don't, I don't think... The fact that the referee... And there's a lot of debate about it at the moment as well. Yeah. The fact that people are split on it tells you as well, was it a certain red card? There's too much debate for it to be certain. And that's why the I don't think... Are the, cl- are the club repeating it, Boric? Um, to be honest, I'm not, I'm, not directly inv- I'm not directly involved, obviously, with the team and that. So I'd assume, I'd assume... So I don't even know what has happened as regards, you know, the usual stuff, the way procedures are with getting a suspension. And I don't know. Um, so obviously, when you're sent off, you're automatically suspended. But um, I personally, I would certainly be appealing it. I think it's, um, you know, I I think it was a, it was yes, it was a big hit. It was it's the people are debating it, but because it's debatable, I think it merits you know um, a review. And I think the referee and the linesman had to chat. And the referee had to go chat to the linesman too. So maybe he wasn't sure either. You know, yeah. and that's that's where it was at in, in my view. And that's that's. That's kind of what I felt at the time, and I watched it as well a few times. Yeah, you, you've achieved a lot with the with that young man, Derek, and you know you've you've had some special days with him. But I assume you'd like them to throw the book at him, yeah? Ah, <laughs> 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 gas man. Gas man. Don't look said to this Carl one night. That's a loaded question. It led it led to the game as well. They see him all playing and going. Yeah, look, yeah, look, and, and, let's and go for it. <laughs> yeah, genuine. Uh, would you believe? Would you believe? I, I actually didn't watch it until last night. I watched the video last night because I said, I said, oh, Jesus, that will come up now. And I, I, I've deliberately tried to stay away from it. And, and I actually have slitters for Austin. I'm supposed to give him the slitters. So I said, I won't give him the slitters till next week. Um, uh, so I said, I'll steer clear of it because, uh, yeah, look, I, I'd be hoping that he's involved. De La Salle played Mount Sinai in one of the best games of the championship last year. It was a brilliant mm. game. right? If you just go back a year, it was an absolutely brilliant game. And it was the, it was kind of, it was the first time I'd seen Austin in, in nearly a year and a half kind of dominate again he got injured I think just before half time of the game last yeah. year and he kind of went out of the game for a bit of the second half but he was really like humming last year in that game um, for, for an amount signed Delisal game and it was a proper championship game the only game that compared it was Delisal and Liz Moore last year in the championship it was a brilliant opening game in the championship as well so he was really humming and you saw from his first round performance against Connie you know and, and it's been well documented how, how good of shape he's in physically etc and you know, it'll be nice to see him evolve. And, you know, it, it's, it makes it all the better for, for everyone and that there's no ambiguity and that he's involved and, and, you know, it'll be a proper championship feel and championship game. So we're, without being, you know, stupidly kind of, you know, kind of unnecessarily fair, uh, De La Salle would hope that he's involved and they're certainly preparing for him to be involved, you know. And, and you know, they're, they're not really debating, really won't he? They're, they're preparing um, for him to be involved and... and um, I'm I'm hopeful that he'll be involved because I, I think it'll make it a, a far better game if he's involved. Yeah. And gi- and and given and given how little hurling we're going to get this year across the board, I think it's vital that he's involved because he you know he's 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 look let's be honest he's a mercurial special talent. He's in as we've all seen from a recent um, <clears throat> social media posts, he's in the shape of his life. Um, he's one he's the he's the kind of hurler. That's it. You know if you're talking. 
Joe Canning, TJ Reid category. He's at that level. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was absolutely flying it, racking up big scores. And I think for something that definitely is a debatable uh, sanction, I think, you know, you'd hope the Waterford CCC would see some sense and um, just give him, give, him, give him the go-ahead to play. Uh, Porig, from for those of us not from Watford and not immersed in the Watford scene, we'd probably say, Jesus, if Mount Sion don't have former hurler of the year, Austin Gleeson, they have in a prayer. But I, I'd assume you'd say that they, there's a team there built up that could hopefully absorb the loss of, of a player like Austin if they had to. Yeah, of course. I think that's the way any any team would have to approach it. You know, you if 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 if, if that blow is dealt, which as I said, hopefully not. But um, yeah, look, we I, I think we as I said we've we've been in a couple of minor county finals. We have a few young lads coming through. Martin O'Neill, as well, back from Canada um, after he was away for a few years there. Um, you know, in the form of Waterford minor Munster winning captain in that. You know, and was involved in the senior panel. That he's a big plus for us to have back. Um, so you know there are, there are players there. Um, it's going to be a huge challenge with Dennis. I've seen them a few times this year, albeit on Zoom. Um, but they are very, they're a very well balanced team. Um, there's no denying that. And they said they won three under twenty ones there, you know, not so long ago. Um, and they're they're in they're in they're in very very good form. I thought they'd been very impressive today, and that's not just saying it because um, you know people are saying they're trying to play them up there. I think if 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 I'm if I'm being honest, I think if anybody's being honest, everybody would see Dennis Al is probably one of the main threats to to mm. Maddie Gunner at the moment, and there's a lot of rivalry there too, given the you know as Derek said the connection in the school and players who play with each other there in the school set up. But yeah, look, I think I do give Mount Sion a chance though this weekend. I think regardless, I give I give I do give us a chance. Right. Jesus, obviously lads are neighbours. This is this is a terrible smack talk altogether, but um, <laughs> it does sound like a nice balance. Can I ask you both then, and I, I'll go to you first, Derek, because you've got experience in Wexford coaching five Harriers. Waterford and Wexford uh, drew a bit of heat for their the structures they gave and the, the timetable they gave for the Hurland Championships, like the Wexford quarters were played last week, Waterford quarters playing this week. Um, Derek, how has that been from a coaching, uh, recovery, training, um, you know, kind of point of view. And also, from the point of view of exposure, you know, that Shells fight Harriers matches on TG Carr last week because it was a knockout game. And now the Watford games, we're here talking about them on the podcast because they're knockout games of prominence. So in a way, speeding up that championship means that you get your, you kind of, you're ahead of the pack when it comes to your knockout games. Yeah, well, you've, you've kind of answered the question that in relation to the GPA format there, you know, in terms of what could happen in terms of exposure down the line. But yeah, a couple of things. First of all, selfishly, I suppose, um, it's worked out perfectly on a personal level in that I'm involved in leash minors and, and the split kind of of being involved in the club and then into the county is, has worked perfectly for me. I think that the decision in both Waterford and Wexford to not have relegation, I'd be honest, I think that was a really good decision. You know, if, if, if for the Harriers, for instance, were in relegation the last couple of years, they were delighted to hear that news. It gave them a sense of kind of freedom in terms of the, the whole thing. And even in Bally Sagar came up from intermediate last year in Waterford, they, lost, they, they drew a group of death in, in Waterford in De La Salle and Abbey side. So they're beating comprehensively in the two matches. I know it presents problems down the lines, etc. I know that. But again, just from listening to the to the the guys on the ground, the condensed nature of the of the the, the club championship has been appealing for the players, you know. And I, I now if you said the rapperies were out after seven days, they played one match on a Saturday and one match the following Friday night, they played their two matches, they're out of the championship. But I think the context of the COVID and the context of not having a championship or having a championship has to be taken into consideration when you're talking about it. And that fellas were glad to get games. But I think it's, it's a possible kind of, you know, signposting of what could happen, not as condensed maybe once every two weeks or, you know, in terms of, or maybe a two groups of six as opposed to two groups mm. of three, you know, where you get more games over that period of five or six weeks before it gets to knockout level um, is definitely. But I, I, my opinion in terms of coaches, I, I love the condensed nature of match after match. And as a player, the boys seem to kind of relish it, albeit, you know, out of the championship now as it stands, but they seem, certainly seem to enjoy the whole nature of certainty, I suppose. Yeah, and, and Porik, has it taken away from the Watford Championship at all, do you think, the fact that it's been kind of, in the eyes of some, been rushed off or, you know, at least play, played as almost as quickly as it could humanly be played? Um, yeah, I don't know, you know how rushed off it is now. I do think there was initial plans. I'm not sure whether it was actually a little bit more condensed even maybe. You know, yeah. that's, that was the thing I think that the reaction was initially for people um, to make sure that there was, you know, an element of that they're, that they're getting a couple of games. I think that, I think all, all counties have done that. In fairness to Waterford and Wexford, they're both dual counties and they have football to consider as well. 
Um, so I do think, I think it's helped um, the fact that or it's all hurling at the moment. I would agree with that. I can see, you can see with Form My Water now who would be very strong with the Nair in football, you know, and Abbeyside will be very strong with Banner Courtney in football in Waterford. They can now focus on hurling, which has been, that's a big plus. And I think that's a, again, maybe something to think about going forward as well as about when you play your football and your hurling championships um, with even a club level. So, um, no, it's, look, it's been, it's been great. I know that my thing is that it's a club period and they have to use it that way. But, you know, you have to make the most of it. The whole idea of any period, be it in the future and next year, if they go into club and county season, is that the period is used to make sure that, that the games are, you know, spaced out properly, but not overly spaced either. It is, people don't want to be waiting three and four weeks for games either. You know, you want them coming pretty quickly as well when you're, play, players would rather be playing matches than going training as well, you know, at times. So, um, you know, no, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying all the games and been logging in online to different ones. And just as regards something you touched on there, as regards the profile or, you know, where, what it would mean for counties, I think, I could be wrong, but I think 700,000 people tuned in on one of the, is that figure correct to watch some of the games last weekend on yeah. podcasts? Yeah, you know, yeah. nationally. That, you might know, be, so. that might be that might be a total. That might be a total, total across, it, yeah. across, across the country. Yeah, yeah. Could across be, all yeah, the country. Things. Yeah, but there is an appetite for club games as well as regards profile. And I think the big thing, you know, that so people will be there, and that's that's marketable. You know, that mm. is marketable, um, and it gives a, a more sustained period of GA coverage in you know print media and you know and so and on social media when you have games going from inter county all the way through the summer. So. Um, you know, no, it's pretty. I, I, I'm pretty happy the way things are at the moment. Um, as I said, there's, there's a lot of club activity, and it's exciting. Yeah, um, I suppose the the fact that the hurling's been played off first, it, it it will in a way obviously aid your successor, both of your successors, I suppose, maybe in in, in Liam Cahill, in that the, the hurlers, those who aren't dual players, will have a bit of time to rest before they go back to inter county training. Um, couldn't have the last two Waterford managers on the podcast and not ask them how they think. Um, it has gone for him. I know we're going back a few, <laughs> a few months now, but um, Derek, you know, had three wins out of five, second in the, in their their division in in the league. Um, he obviously made a couple of tough calls when he came in in terms of players who um, were left off the panel. Um, has he has he has he succeeded thus far? Do you think? Would you be going into the championship with some optimism? Yeah, I, you know, going there every year with optimism, to be honest with you. I, yeah, I think I still think there's really good players in Water. I think it's, um, yeah, he's, he's done really well. Like it's, 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 it's no different, I suppose, than, than any other year in, in terms of even when I was involved myself, you get a kind of a, you get a period in Water where, where, you know, I think what's changed in Water is the bar has changed in terms of expectancy. You know, I think that's, that's, that's the key thing. That's the key point in, in Liam's favour, I think, more than anything, is that there's a kind of a more pragmatic, a viewpoint as to where we stand and, and that makes us exceptionally dangerous I think to to other teams then in terms of just the, the general perception you know and I think that's uh, there seems to be as I said a kind of a line in the sand moment where players have said to themselves listen you know we'll give this a right shot see where it goes from in terms of um, you know the, the year ahead if you like so yeah it's done really well and it's look it's we put so much of an emphasis on on, on the managers nowadays that you know, we kind of tend to forget that, that there's, there's a certain amount of players involved. And, and I think they've, they've obviously got a good pre-season and it was very obvious for me that they've, they were extremely, you know, focused from the start of the year. They've, they've been back training early doors and they, they brought that momentum, that physical momentum into the league. And that was very obvious, obvious in terms of how they play. The interesting thing now is with, with, the, with the COVID and with the kind of loss of momentum will be the kind of, you know, Re, re-focusing on decisions that have been made. Does he revisit them? Does he go back? Yeah. Does he kind of look at the club championship and say to himself, well, Shane Bennett is going well or Morris is going well or Noel is going well with passage or does he, you know, go with a kind of an outside one where Philip Manny is still dominant at centre-back for Valley Gunner? So they'll be the interesting things in terms of the dynamic. Does, is the dynamic gone? I know in Ross Common football and some other teams, they've, you know, they've brought guys in that have been outside the panel. So that, that'll be the interesting one for me. Or does he stay with the momentum that he has gained from, from the early league involvement? Yeah. Um, Porik, it's an incredibly simplistic way of looking at things, but it's, it's hard not to when, you know, the, the first two round Robin Munster Championships did not go well for Watford. The last win in the Munster Championship is back in 20, 2016. Do you, do you think it's a good thing for Liam that it's back to knockout hurling? Or is, is that really an irrelevance in your opinion? Yeah, it's hard hard to know, and like, I'm kind of you know wary about comment. I suppose Liam is very much his own man, you know. So that's why I asked you I've, about fixtures. Yeah, <laughs> about the fixtures, so I leave that to you know. They give him the space to do that and learn his yeah. own 
his own thing on that. But um, yeah, in regards to the fixtures, I think it suits Waterford, um, that type of championship. I, I, I actually feel, looked you're dead right, it didn't go well, <laughs> um, you know, the last couple. But, um, but I do think the type of championship we're going into now has suited Waterford in previous years. And I think, you know, in 2017, we got a good run, you know, through that kind of a setup where we, you know, we didn't get off to a good start and we, we actually got into, got a good win the next round and we progressed and, you know, gained momentum. And I think it does suit Waterford. So I'm looking forward to it. And as they're, quite, they're, they're serious players in Waterford. Um, I, I wouldn't change my view on that and I think they are very dangerous um, I'm, I'm looking forward they've had a really good league um, and as a Waterford man and Waterford supporter I'm looking forward to what's coming down the tracks there as well and you know getting to, get to see getting to see what comes out after the after the championship and there's some there's some lads stepping up to the plate now in the local championship as well I see Michael Kiley now is back injury free and playing well so it'll be very interesting to see that'll be an interesting game the weekend too with Abbey side, you have Morris on one side and Michael on the other, Connor Prunty probably going to Manmark there on Morris and maybe David Pendergast, you know, and, you know, as well in the, in the, in the Liz Moore side, probably going to pick up, you know, Michael Kiley. So it's going to be interesting, you know? Mm. One, the one thing, Mikey, the one thing that I, the one thing that I'd suggest on uh, inter-county managers um, in relation to whether, like, wh- whether or not they'll be judged Good, bad, or indifferent this year. I don't think there'll be any judgment at all. I think you can't really judge. I think this year, I, if I was like, we've already told our own, like we brought in a new guy this year to manage our club side. And we've already said to him, look, this year, forget about it. It's a free hit. You will, you won't be judged until twenty twenty one proper league campaign and a proper championship behind you. And that's really where you will be judged. And I'd say that would probably go for the likes of the Jack O'Connors, you know, the lads that are in their first year in Liam Cal, Jack O'Connor, Mike Quirk, um, mm. you know, any guys that are in their first year in. This Paul year, Galvin, me, don't forget Paul Galvin. Paul oh, Galvin, correct. Like, this year, this year, for me, for a lot of these guys, would would, would seem to be a, like a free hit. And go in, see how you get on. You might win, you might get a run in a championship, you might win in Munster, you might, you might even make an All-Ireland semi-final final. Who knows? It could be a very freakish year if the championships get played. But ultimately, I think an awful lot of these guys won't be judged until the end of 2021 so the pressure's off and I think that's a good thing yeah um, we'll leave it at that gents I suppose I won't ask for a prediction for, for this weekend's match because I think I know what, what you'll both predict but so I'll just ask you both then can can Bally Gunner be stopped this year and if so who'll be the team to stop them Boric um, can it be stopped I think look I always think if a team they're, they're obviously someone's going to have to play really really well and they're going to you know whether where they're at at the moment, they've been cruising so far. Um, so it's hard to know. I think, of course, I put my Mount Sinai hat on. You'd be hoping you get a, you, know, <laughs> you, you want to progress and get a cut of it, but you know and see and test where you are. It's, like we haven't played Bally Gunner in a number of years, so we don't know where we are even in relation mm. to that bar. Um, and no, likewise, Bally that is I want to do the same. Abbey side, you know, have a have a have a, have a good a good a good outfit for my water with Jamie Barron, Conor Gleeson, and as the weekend, they'll step up to it and have a go at it. You know, so I don't know. Can they be stopped? I'd like to think, I'd like to, obviously, with a, from my own club's perspective, I'd like to think they could. I think it's going to be very difficult for someone. They're, um, they're a seriously talented outfit with a, a, with a conveyor belt of talent coming as well. But um, look, that's further down the line, I suppose. <laughs> um, for my water, we'll have a go at it this weekend. And, you know, whoever comes out then of the other teams and the amount signed that is Sal or whoever's left in it, they'll be next up if, if they do get over for my water. And that's the way it'll roll. And Derek, can you see Dallas Al ending their eight-year wait? I can, yeah. If you want me to be completely straight, yeah, I think, I think we'll win the championship this year in Waterford. I, I've I've seen the boys playing. I've seen them playing Clara and Gory and a few. I just think they're going really well uh, without being kind of overconfident. But I'll be straight about it. I suppose I think, I think that I think as Porrick has alluded to the three twenty ones, the you know twelve minutes to go in the county final last year. There was a point in it all, be it was nine in it in the end with Bally Gunner. I just think they're. I think they're primed for it, and I'm hoping that that'll be the case, you know. But uh, and, and if that comes, and that's not in any way overconfident. I just think they're going really well, and I'd expect them to do well this year. Yeah, I think if if they're to be stopped, it'll be certainly it'll be a little sad. All right. Well, you've you've wet our appetite for the weekend. A um, couple of Dublin football matches on uh, the Thanks. TV on Saturday evening, Rory. Thomas, yeah, Thomas Davis, uh, last year's beaten county finalists in a must-win game against Ballymun Kickhams, who are are already qualified. And that will be followed then by a straight knockout um, in Jack McCaffrey's Clontarf, 
versus uh, Damon Connolly's at St. Vincent's. St. Vincent's obviously with the tradition and the history. Clontarf would be kind of considered the nouveau riche. But the talk is that Vincent's have gone back a bit. They shipped a heavy beating at home to Ballyboden um, two weeks ago, conceding five goals in Park Maeve which is very unusual for them. So they've and John Brennan and a few other guys have stepped away. The defence might be a little bit leaky, so it could be an opportunity for Clontarf to um, to pull off a famous victory. And that starts at 10 past five. Coverage, Jason Sherlock, Neil McAvoy on the panel. Uh, throw in half five, half seven. There you go. And there'll obviously be reports, reaction from around the country on Saturday and Sunday Sport on Radio 1. And we'll have lots more coverage on the RT website and the News Now app. So it just leaves me to say thank you very much to Porik and to Derek and to Rory. And um, we'll see you all again next week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks guys. Cheers, guys. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses.